Good morning. I hope that you are all very well this morning. We, uh, we are, as the video suggests, in, um, in a very tense moment in the scriptures. A moment which is elongated in John's gospel uh, to almost half of the text itself. Um, and, and right now, we, we are approaching the moments that are the, you know, to be literary and dramatic, the denouement, the, the coming to the point where the resolution to the story is about to be achieved and the tension is great. Jesus' disciples are scared. I don't know if you've ever been scared, I mean, really, really unsure of the future, uh, but that, that's how they're feeling at this moment. They, they are... In the upper room, Jesus' betrayer is at hand. The cross is just near. We're somewhere between the triumphal entry and the moment when the same crowds that shouted Hosanna will shout crucify him. And now his disciples, his 12, the the guys that he's been walking with for three years, the guys that are family to him, now they're really starting to get that this is not going to turn out the way they thought it was going to. They had their ideas of the Jesus administration and, you know, getting a good cabinet seat in that administration, maybe an ambassadorship, something like that. It was going to go great. And that's not it at all. Now, the hour has come. And Jesus' disciples are terrified. They're terrified, they're scared, they're probably feeling all the things that go along with being scared, the feeling of alone, feeling of abandonment, feeling of fear, feeling maybe a frustration or anger or disappointment, and Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that. Today, we're going to be in two chapters of the Bible. Now, don't be scared. <laughs> You'll get out by dinner. Uh, <laughs> You know, the previous service, I said, well, you know, this won't take too long because there's a service that has to come after you. Our next service is at 5.30. You should think about that. Um, (laughs) No, I'm just playing. But we're going to be in in these two chapters of Scripture. And and what I want to do is do something a little bit differently. Normally, we'll kind of go line by line. But I want to lift out a theme from these two chapters, uh, from the most of 14, all of 15, and a bit of 16. I want to lift out a theme, mainly the theme of the role and person and work of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be skipping around a lot, so it might just behoove you to open your Bible to chapter 14, 15, and 16 of John and prepare to write notes and stuff, but just follow us on the screen because we're going to, we're going to jump, out, uh, jump around just a little bit. Please read with us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, from whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. We skip down to verse 26 of chapter 14, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Moving on to chapter 15, I am the true vine. And my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are all gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me. 
But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and fruit that will remain. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Whoever hates me hates my Father also. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are yet to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus you would help us today. God, I I fear that we do not truly believe in the Holy Spirit sometimes. Help us repent of that. And today, Lord, help us to hear truth, be guided into truth, be filled with, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, we're at this moment in the text where the disciples are scared and terrified and alone and the tension in the story is high. And into this moment, Jesus says, listen, don't let your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. And the way he tells them not to be afraid is something completely unexpected to us. I mean, typically the way we comfort one another is, hey, don't worry, it's all going to be okay. And we use a lot of like emotional platitudes and Jesus doesn't say that at all. Hey, don't be afraid. Uh, It's, uh, you know, neither let your heart be troubled because I am going away and this is for your good and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Now, we hear that, and if you've been at Christianity for very long, then, you know, you probably at least believe that, or at least agree that that is true factually. But I think, functionally, we drastically underestimate the power and the person of God, the Holy Spirit. I think, functionally, we, Christians, and and this is important for those of you who aren't yet Christians, I'm glad that you're here. I know that some of you are here checking out Christianity and you're exploring spiritual things. Awesome. I'm super glad that you're here. You should be here for this because one of the ways we misrepresent Christianity to you is when we treat it as a philosophy and not what it is, a relationship with a supernatural deity named God that is empowered by his spirit dwelling in his people. See, when we treat Christianity as a mere, like, philosophy, way to get things done, worldview, that's good. It's just not all the way correct. You know what I'm saying? It it is reductionistic. Yes, Christianity does present a ton of philosophical truth that we could all think about and enjoy for a very long time. And yes, it is a worldview. Yes, there's obedience involved in it and all of those things. However, it is not merely those things because it is about being connected to, related to, actually, in real life, relationally to God. And what I want you to understand and what I believe Jesus wants us to understand from these two chapters of Scripture is that without the empowerment and the presence and the connectivity to God, the Holy Spirit, that will never, never happen. I think we drastically, drastically underestimate the power and person of God, the Holy Spirit. So from this text, what I want to lift out thematically are 12 functions of the Holy Spirit. 12 roles, 12 ministries. I said the word 12 and three of you just went, (gasps) shalom, it will be okay. We have ushers, they have Gatorade, you'll be fine. Um, (laughs) Let's begin here. Chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus comes out with this, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, a few years back, a dude named Gary Smalley wrote a book that helped me a lot called The Five Love Languages. I don't know if you 
have ever read this book. If you ever hope to relate positively to any other human beings, you should pick it up. Um, because it, it, it kind of saved my marriage. Uh, so it turns out the way I really receive love is by like words of affirmation. And so I would try to love my wife by like writing her notes and telling her I love her and how great she is. And it bounced off her like grease off Teflon. It didn't work at all. Because I wasn't helping her like with the stuff of life. See, see, her love language is like acts of service. So instead, of, if I could just shut my mouth and like just do something for her, that makes her feel very, very good, right? So this is not important. You don't care. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was more cathartic for me, but all right. God has a love language, and it's obedience. It's not any of the five Dr. Smalley lays out. Jesus' love language is obedience. If you love him, you will obey him, and that should make many of you feel very uncomfortable at this moment. Because some of us are like, no, I love Jesus, because when Becca's up here playing the guitar, I'm just like, yes. Or maybe your goalpost worship, yes. <laughs> you know, like whatever. You know, and I love Jesus because I emote to him. Listen, I want you to emote in worship. That's part of what it's for. If you stand by and just hold your coffee and you do this in worship, that's not worship. That's watching. That's something else. I, I want you to, we do want you to participate. The band doesn't come and play me on stage. This is not the Tonight Show. Um, all right, this is church. But that is not merely or even mostly how our love for God is reflected. Our love for God is reflected in our obedience to his son, Jesus. And if you love him, you will obey him. Which at this point should make you go, oh, oh. So obeying Jesus is hard. Obeying Jesus is hard because he's always about our heart motives, right? It's never just like, you know, just do these six things. That's easy. Six things, no big deal. This is Boston. You guys are achievers. No problem. It's hard. If any of you have ever been at this for very long and you want to obey Jesus and you want to bring your money under the lordship of Jesus and your body under the lordship of Jesus and how you uh, view sexuality and how you view your future and how you just, all, of it, all the stuff of life you just want to put under the lordship of Jesus, you will find rather quickly that that is somewhat challenging. Actually, it's impossible. Which leads us to the first ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us obey. Jesus gives them an impossible commandment. If you love me, keep my commandments, which we can't do. And he knows that. We are responsible for it, however. It's because we can't do it. We don't throw up our hands and go, well, no, 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 no. We're responsible for it. And the, and the, the whole point of this is that the Holy Spirit is given to you to help you obey. If you want to obey Jesus, if you want to be conformed to the image of his likeness, if you want to act like him and talk like him and treat others the way he treats them, then the way you do that is not by merely do it. That's not Christianity. In fact, the Bible tells us anything that does not proceed from faith is sin. Without faith, it is impossible to uh, please God because to please him, you must uh, believe that he exists and believe that he is your rewarder if you earnestly seek him. You must trust him for even the ability to obey him, and that comes through God, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps you obey. If you love me, keep my commandments. In chapter 15, he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Basically, if you don't obey him, you don't love him. And if you obey him, it's because the Holy Spirit is working in you. And really, if you want to have a life that's marked, I'm not talking about, you know, like I disobeyed him once, so I hate him. Don't hear any of that. Come on, let's, let's talk about trajectories, though. Don't you want there to be kind of an up and to the right curve to this thing? I do. That's the Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit. It's, it requires the Holy Spirit. So if you find it challenging or difficult to obey Christ, ask for help from the Holy Spirit. This is what he's for. The second ministry of the Holy Spirit is to remind us, to tell us we are not alone. We are not alone. I find it fascinating in just tightly packed metropolitan areas that the rates of depression and suicide rise completely disproportionately to how geographically close we are. Because you'd think if we all just kind of packed ourselves in tighter, like we'd talk. <laughs> But well, we don't, man. Like, go get on the tee, y you know, when it's running. Get on the tee. Um, you know, and everyone's got their earbuds in, the metro up, and it's like, you know, the, the worst thing you could ever do is say, hello. Like, don't mm -hmm. <laughs> do that, right? It's very easy to feel alone psychologically, emotionally. Okay, add that to that. This, one of the best, most brilliant tactics of your enemy 
is to make you feel alone. So aside from the fact that just the where you live just gives itself to loneliness just by virtue of being here, you have a very real spiritual enemy whose life mission is to make you feel as you are not, make you feel alone. No one understands me. And you don't get my story. No one's, you know, you didn't have the, the childhood I had or, you know, you, you don't know my financial problems or my issues or what I'm dealing with. And all of a sudden, you start repeating this thing. I'm alone. No one cares about me. Nobody loves me. And one of the ministries, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to remind you, you are not alone. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans even as he is preparing to actually leave them. I mean, I will not leave you, but I gotta go. Like, <laughs> Matthew 28, 18 through 20, just before he leaves them, he says, and surely I will be with you always. Bye. I mean, <laughs> you're like, okay, uh, how's that? That's, okay, well, obviously, it, it's not Jesus Christ here next to us. It is the spirit of Jesus among us and within us. That's the only way it works. He actually says, and I find this very challenging to believe because as much as I love being your preacher, I would love to sit myself right there and let Jesus do it. Don't amen that too much. Uh, <laughs> make me feel bad. No, of course, we would rather hear from Jesus, right? And Jesus is saying, it's actually better that I'm not here teaching you because if I go, I send the Holy Spirit to you. He will not leave you alone. I will not leave you as orphans. The only way that happens is when we are connected to God, the Holy Spirit. He is the one who never leaves us. Jesus Christ is not physically here. He is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father, in a glorified body waiting to return and give us ours, and that will be great. But until that time, he's given us the Holy Spirit, and we are not alone. Look at me. If you belong to Jesus, you are never alone. Third ministry, the Holy Spirit exalts the teachings of Jesus. Like, like elevates the words of Jesus. He says this in uh, 1425, but the helper... The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You know, when we come together and, and, and I open the Bible or whoever is up here opens the Bible and preaches it to you, we pray first. Do you know why? Because the worst thing that could happen is that you get my opinions merely about this text. That's not going to help you very much. It might be interesting. It might be terribly offensive. It might be right. It might be wrong. But it won't change you because that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And what we need is God to send the Holy Spirit to illuminate this text to you even as it's being preached. When you show up in your groups throughout the week, which I hope you're all involved in. You should be in one if you're not. If, if you show up there, when you open the text, you're not just there to listen to a guy or a gal tell you about the text. What you're doing, hopefully, is praying and asking, Holy Spirit, like this thing up. And, and I know it happens to you because I talk to you after I preach sometimes, and you come and tell me, hey, I really loved it when you said this, and I didn't say that. <laughs> like, it was really powerful to me when you were talking about this, and I'm like, that wasn't me, brother. <laughs> it was not in my notes at all. Were you even here? <laughs> like, but thank you. Uh, what, it will happen today. It happened in the last service, and I was like, no one else is watching this. I wish they were. <laughs> You know, I just really, but that's because if, if you are coming to this text with faith, then the Holy Spirit is illuminating it to you. And if you've been at this thing for very long, if you, you know, at Christianity more than, say, a few months, then he might be, while I'm talking or while someone else is unpacking the text, highlighting to you in the back of your mind or in the seat of your soul a thing that happened or that other Bible passage that you read or that other thing, that other preacher at another time, and it's all of a sudden tying a nice pretty bow on the teaching that you're getting to actually transform you. That's a ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why we pray first. Now you know. The Holy Spirit makes us brave. The Holy Spirit makes us brave. It's the next thing. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, we read in verse 28 and 29 of chapter 14. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away and will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father and the Father is greater than I. Now, Put yourself back in the context of those to whom he is speaking. What's about to happen is Rabbi Jesus, leader Jesus, good buddy, spiritual father Jesus is about to get arrested, tortured, crucified, which is a slow murder, and then shoved in a hole in the side of a rock. That's terrifying. 
That's absolutely terrifying that the spiritual family that these people know is about not just to like lose their pastor, they're going to all scatter. You know, one of them is going to sell him out and go kill himself. Another of them, the leader of them, is going to deny Jesus to a little girl by cussing her out three times. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. How's that? How's that? Of course they're afraid. This is a terrifying thing that they're facing. And one of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to make you brave. Cowardice is not a feature of God's people. Not for long, at least. Jesus never comes to make you a coward, and some of you are cowards. Faced with the option of doing the right thing or the wrong thing, you're choosing the wrong thing because you're a coward and you're afraid. And you can repent of that fear and by that I, I just mean turn your back on it and ask the Holy Spirit to come and make you brave because following Jesus is difficult and requires some emotional cost to it it might require you changing your plans it might require you I don't know humbling yourself and apologizing to your girlfriend or boyfriend or your spouse but the Holy Spirit can make you brave I love that. Jesus says, obey me, but don't worry. I'm going to give you the ability to obey, and I'm going to give you the emotional fortitude to deal with what happens when you do. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit, and I'm going to make you brave. The Holy Spirit can absolutely make you brave. The next ministry of the Holy Spirit, he unites us to Christ. Okay, so what happens after all of this? He launches into chapter 15, wherein he gives us like a big, long analogy of what it's like when we live in this dynamic connectivity of relationship with God through fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He's like, it's like you're a branch, and I'm the vine, and God the Father, he's like the gardener. And he takes you, and he grafts you into, um, grafts you into the vine. And then all of a sudden what happens is like new sap, new life flows, and, and some fruit is born. And so then what what my father does, he's going to come around and if you're not bearing fruit, he's going to clip some stuff so that you do. And if you are bearing fruit, he's going to clip some stuff so that you bear more fruit. But if you rip yourself off of me, you're going to fall off, you're going to die, you're going to wither because you're disconnected from the vine. That's why you need to be connected to me. So the Holy Spirit unites us to Christ. In systematic theology, there is a whole doctrine and, and set of following ones called union with Christ. They're fascinating. And we get them from here. Because one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to not just tell us we're saved, not, you know, not, not Christians, but to unite us with Christ so that we abide in Him and He abides in us. You realize that physically that's not possible, right? You can't be in and then, like, Right, that doesn't work. That's because it requires God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit to dwell in you and around you and come through you to others. That is abiding. Now abide. We don't use this word very often. Like I ask, what are you, you going to do today? Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go abide at home. <laughs> and I don't know, whittle or something. Like, this is not a word that we, sorry for all the whittlers out there, didn't mean to offend you. Um, uh, Abide just mean, means live, right? So I abide in my house because that's where my family is and my stuff and my wife and my kids and, and, and I live there and, and so I'm with them and they're with me and we're together and we're in, we're in this thing called family and Jesus is saying like, yeah, 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 like that. Abide in me, I'm gonna abide in you and the only way that happens is if the Holy Spirit unites you and I. Just like I'm united to my Father, in a manner kind of like that, you're going to be united to me. Because I'm leaving, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you, and that's going to happen. It'll be like vines and branches and fruit. It's going to be amazing. By the way, not in the notes. If you abide, don't be surprised when he prunes stuff. Please. Just because you abide in the Holy Spirit does not mean, therefore, that he will never cut you Of course he will cut you. He will cut all that is gangrenous and cancerous and wrong off of you so that fruit may grow. That's what happens in relationships, especially in relationships with God. What did you expect that he would agree with you all the time? Oh, that would be if you were God. 
um, which involves a whole set of psychologically unhealthy designations. You're not. <laughs> okay? You're not God. The next ministry of the Holy Spirit is that he enables love. He says, okay, abide in me, stay connected to me. Okay, it's, it's going to be like vines and fruit and all that good stuff. And, and so I want you to do all that. I want you to abide. I want you to live in my love. How does that work? Because the only way we know how to love God, not just know but can actually do it, is if we're connected to the Holy Spirit. Now, this is very important because you smart people might miss this. So let me just break it down for you. Jesus shows us what love is. The Holy Spirit enables us to do it. 1 John 4 says, this is what love is. In this is love, the following, colon. Jesus Christ dying on the cross, that is love. That's what love looks like. God dying for you who deserve to die, that's what love looks like. The one who is most worthy, the, the highest cost possible paid on your behalf, that is what love looks like. You only know how greatly you're loved in proportion to how much it costs the lover to love you. There is no higher cost than God's life, so you're loved. But just knowing that does not empower you to do it. It merely shows you what it is. The Holy Spirit enables you to do it. Because love is the fundamental pouring out of self for the sake of others. Well, eventually you'll run out of you and then you'll die. You'll get emotionally spent, have an anxiety attack or something. But if you're connected to God, the Holy Spirit, then there is something flowing in you at a faster and greater rate than what is flowing out of you. And now you can love. The Holy Spirit enables you to love God. He also enables you to love others, which just so you know is kind of hard, right? I mean, have you met other people? They're weird, right? I mean, none of you, uh, of course. Um, none of you, you're fine, but everybody else. Um, no, I mean, it's really hard to love other people, people you really like, people that you really want to love, right? Your friends, sometimes, you know, you're eating, and then there's that one who didn't get taught by mom to chew with their mouth closed, and you're like... I want to stab you with my fork, but I'm not. I'm just letting you know what bothers me. <laughs> Don't stab people with forks. But not doing it requires the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> All right. Like people you really like, it's hard, it's hard to love them. It's hard to pour yourself out continually for others, especially when it's not reciprocated. But that's precisely what God has done. So often we go, oh, I'm loving, I'm loving, I'm loving, you know, I'm just giving my life away for my kids or for my girlfriend or my boyfriend or for my spouse and I'm just not getting anything in return. Great. Welcome to what it is to be like God. Congratulations. That's what love is. Now, you, it's impossible without the Holy Spirit. So abide. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is not only to make you feel loved, but to enable you to love others to enable you to love God. Jesus' commandment is that we love one another. Now, this is, this is fascinating. Now, back up at the top, he said, this is my commandment. You're, if you love me, obey me. Right? Jesus' love language is obedience. And now he's saying, okay, do you know what I want you to obey? you know what my commandment is? Love one another. Impossible to do without the Holy Spirit. How about the Holy Spirit brings fruitfulness? You did not choose me, but I appointed you, in chapter 15, verse 16, I chose you. And appointed you to bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. I love being here because so many of you are going to go do crazy, amazing things in the world. You just are. I love hearing about all your stories, how you travel everywhere and do all these cool things. You're going to go do amazing things. You're going to do things here. You're going to do things around the world. That's awesome. Don't you want to bear some fruit? Come on, if you belong to Jesus, it, 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 he didn't rescue you so that you could just therefore go do whatever you like. No, he rescued you that you might bear fruit. I mean, the, the point of the game is not just to get a bunch of people in this room. The, the point of the game is to get the people in the room and in the, you know, the dozens of other rooms all across the city so that we can make disciples who bear fruit in thousands and millions of different ways that I'd never even thought of. That's impossible without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables you to be fruitful. Some of you, you've been praying for your friend, you've been praying for mom or dad or brother or sister or whatever, and, and you want to see some fruit happen. Some of you, you really do earnestly desire to honor God and make disciples. That, by the way, is rather challenging. So ask the Holy Spirit. He will make you fruitful. 
In fact, the whole reason Jesus chose you is that you should bear fruit, and not just fruit that withers and dies, but fruit that remains. Remains. So that when this world passes away, what you did will not. And it will be a feature of God's new world. But as the Holy Spirit brings fruitfulness, the Holy Spirit will also attract the hatred of the world. Oh, less amens on that one. If God, the Holy Spirit, is in you, then the world will hate you. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, therefore, go be a Christian jerk. Thank you. That role has been filled sufficiently. We are no longer in need of that. We would really love for you to be just a a Christian, just boring, normal, run-of-the-mill, filled with the Holy Ghost Christian. Um, Orthodox, not creative, just faithful. Just Jesus, by the way, never called you to be creative. He just called you to be faithful. Just throwing that out there. Um, I want to do something new for Jesus. Have you tried the old stuff first? Just try the old stuff. Honor God, make disciples, don't screw up your life. Just go with that for a while. See how that, you know, get loosened up on that. All right? We should rename it just boring church. Just the same boring stuff. But as you do that, the world will hate you. Because it hates him. If you look like Jesus and the world hates Jesus, then the world will hate you. And that shouldn't be surprising. I mean, when we look in the, in the world, our heart breaks on one hand. I mean, I, I've lost count of just over the last two weeks of like how many new Christian martyrs have made the headlines. I mean, there, there's hundreds and hundreds of girls constantly being abducted in, uh, by Boko Haram in North Africa. And then if that's true of what we can see, what, is, what must be true of what we can't, I mean, in Western China, the Middle East, it, there's, it's happening everywhere. This should not surprise you, though. He said it would happen. I mean, Christians, we're hilarious. We're like, I, I live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, for a minute. But are you really surprised? I mean, he said it. It's like right here. It's also right here <laughs> and here. It's everywhere in this text that this is going to happen. And the Holy Spirit will attract the hate in you, will attract the hatred of the world. The world hates you. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, the world hates you. Remember that I said this to you. A servant isn't greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will do the same thing to you. I have said these things to you, however, to keep you from falling, he says in the beginning of chapter 16. They'll put you out of the synagogues, and when they treat you badly, they'll think they're doing God's work. That requires no comment at all. But the Holy Spirit will also empower you to bear witness about Christ. A ninth feature of the Holy Spirit. He will empower you to bear witness about Christ. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me and you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Listen, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you will bear witness to Jesus who has sent the Holy Spirit to you and through you to others. That's part of his function. God didn't just send the Holy Spirit so that his people could feel nice. No, God sends the Holy Spirit, and we're really going to see this at the end of Luke's gospel and the beginning of his second book, Acts. One of the primary reasons that Jesus sends the Holy Spirit is that you might have power to bear witness to Jesus, because it's hard. I know that it's hard, but it's not hard here. Don't tell me it's hard here. It's not harder in Boston than it was in Corinth. It's not harder in Boston than it was in Athens. It's not harder in Boston than it was in Macedonia or Rome, certainly Rome. No one has let, yet stuck you on a stick and lit you on fire to cast light at night. Don't tell me it's hard. It's hard to other places, but Americans, Westerners, please, until it actually is, let us not complain. Let us just be unsurprised and unbelievably faithful and so connected to God, the Holy Spirit, that we can be slapped on one cheek and turn the other. That when it is demanded of us to go one mile, we can go two. The Holy Spirit bears witness about Jesus and empowers us to do the same thing. To open our mouths, by the way. That whole, uh, you know, preach the gospel at all times, use words when necessary. Okay, aside from the fact that I'm pretty sure St. Francis never actually said it. It's terrible advice anyway. You know who you should obey before you obey St. 
so-and-so. Jesus, who said, obey me and then open your mouth about me. Just thought for you to think about. Holy Spirit bears witness about Christ. And that's good news to you because when you open your mouth to bear witness about Jesus, the Holy Spirit is also going to be convicting the world. The Holy Spirit convicts the world. We read here in uh, chapter 16, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It is really good news. In fact, some of you, perhaps this is happening right now, or it has happened, you remember the time where you were sitting and you encountered the gospel and the Holy Spirit began to just convict you of sin. That's not something that you should resist and go, no, 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 I'm fine. That's something that you should go, ooh, what is that? What is it about my life that I, up to this point, I thought was fine But now it seems like God, the Holy Spirit, wants to put his finger on it and go, that thing. I want that thing. The Holy Spirit will convict people of sin. This is good news so that when you open your mouth, you're not responsible for the results. You're just responsible for being faithful. That's why you pray, by the way. Do you know why you pray for people to hear the gospel and believe it? Because only God can actually do that. You can't. Your job is to be faithful. Bear witness, and the Holy Spirit comes and convicts people of sin, not just of their sin, but also of righteousness, Jesus tells us. Righteousness because he goes to the Father. This, this means, okay, I'm not only just going to you know, get everybody sad about their sin, but I'm also going to let them know they can be made right because I'm going to the Father, okay? So the third part of the conviction, and of judgment, that the ruler of this world, and, and I love this because when we hear judgment, we think, oh, because Jesus is going to send folks to hell. That's not what he's saying. He's saying of judgment because the ruler of this world, your spiritual enemy, to whom you have been subjugated by your own sin, he is done. He's judged. His reign is coming to an end because I'm the king. I go to my father to sit on my throne and rule. The Holy Spirit leads us to truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are yet to come. Now, this maybe seems a little counterintuitive, because if you've been around Christians for very long, we don't always agree on stuff. You noticed? Oh dear, you haven't noticed. Okay, it's going to happen. Um, it's going to happen that, that uh, the Christians will agree, and so sometimes we read this verse and go, well, if the Holy Spirit's going to lead us into all truth, how can we disagree about these, you know, finer tertiary points of doctrine? And that's not, I think, what this is actually about, because the people that Jesus is talking to at this moment, or many of them, a handful of them at least, are going to be the people who would later, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, be writing the words of Holy Scripture, Right? And so one layer of meaning of what Jesus is saying here is that, yeah, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to lead you, particularly you, you, and you, into all truth because you're going to write it down. Level one. Level two, I will send the Holy Spirit to lead y'all, second person plural, you. We should should really adopt that. I know it's the Northeast, but y'all is very helpful. Um, Every other language has their version of y'all. Only English doesn't. It's very confusing. Just throwing that out there. I'm going to lead you all, y'all, into truth by my spirit so that you have unity amongst you. I mean, there, this is something to think about. There are some, like, three billion Christians on planet Earth, and I know that we often, like, make a big deal about what we don't agree about, but there's quite a bit that we do agree about. Like, three or four ecumenical creeds, these 66 books, the nature of God, the nature of Christ, the nature of man, like, there's a lot of agreement. That's a miracle of God the Holy Spirit. All of this finally leads to the final function of God the Holy Spirit. Chapter 16, verse 14, He will glorify me, for He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that He will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit delights to shine a spotlight on Jesus. The Holy Spirit delights to shine a spotlight in Jesus, to glorify Jesus. And I want to unpack this word just for a second at the risk of being a little bit painstaking because we, glory is one of those Christian words that we use and we're all like, yeah, glory, what's that mean? I don't know, just sing it. You know, and and we use it and we don't really know what it means. Glory is, glory is like a catch-all term. It's a catch-all phrase for God's perfection manifested. So all of his nature his omnipotence, his omniscience, his 
benevolence, his goodness, his sovereignty, his grace, his mercy, his power, his justice, all of those attributes of his nature that are, are very esoteric and kind of out there. Glory, you are experiencing God's glory when you can see them, when you can touch them, when you can feel them, when you can experience them. That's why you were made for God's glory. Not because God is selfish and just wants you to sing to him because he doesn't want you to like anything else. It's not it. Because he is the highest possible good in every possible way and the best possible thing you could ever have is all of his nature all of the time to an ever-increasing extent. So glorifying the Father is the greatest thing you could ever do. And Jesus says, the Holy Spirit it's going to connect you to me. And I'm connected to my Father. And everything my Father has is mine. And everything I have is yours. So if, if you abide in me, if you obey me, if you're filled with my Spirit, I'm not leaving you. I'm creating a ten-lane superhighway from the Father to you. That's what I'm going to do. All of God's goodness, all of God's power, all of God's blessing, so much more bandwidth on this thing than you've ever accessed, that I've ever accessed. He is making available, and it's to his glory that you experience it. It's to his glory that you get to see, taste, hear, experience a little bit of that. Yes, does he absolutely need to transform you? Yes. Does he need to convict you of sin? Yes. Does he need you to lead you in righteousness? Yes. But all of that is not an end into itself. It, all of that leads to this final thing. You were made for the glory of God. And without the Holy Spirit, you'll never experience it. So... Ask him for the Holy Spirit. See, we have an advantage over the disciples. We are not waiting for God to send anything. He already has. But as I said at the beginning, we so drastically underestimate the person and power of God, the Holy Spirit, that we miss it. And so my invitation to you today is simply this. Be filled. That's it. That's why we took communion at the front of our service because we're going to sing and we're going to worship and we're going to make this an opportunity for you to be prayed for. Some of you, you need power to obey. Like you are disobedient and you don't know how to stop disobeying Jesus. Well, we can pray for you. You can be enabled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Some of you feel so alone and so desperately sad. Well, we can pray for you, and God the Holy Spirit can come and dwell with you. Some of you are so myopic that you, you don't understand the text beyond your own needs, and the Holy Spirit would love to come and illuminate it to you. Some of us are afraid, you're cowards, and the Holy Spirit can make you brave. Some of you have a hard time loving one another, and you need the Holy Spirit so that you can extend actual self giving love to somebody else. Some of you need the Holy Spirit because the world is hating you and Jesus wants to come and alongside you with this helper and make you brave. Some of you need the conviction of the Holy Spirit because you're in sin. Those of you in here who are not yet followers of Christ, the Holy Spirit would love to come and say, you, I want you to follow me. This is sin. Turn from it and come and follow me. All of us, all of us can be so connected to God, the Holy Spirit, that the glory of heaven starts to flow out of us, and we are not survivors on a wasteland. We are colonists of a new world. So Jesus, help us today.